Call a meeting to order in accordance with 940 CMR 29.10, remote participation adopted by the Greater Lowell Technical School Committee, April 17, 2014. Many men who here will be participating at tonight's meeting remotely. No in-person attendance of members of the public will be permitted. All rise for the Pledge of Allegiance. Roll call. Yeah. Mr. Gigi? Here. Mr. Gutierrez? Yeah. Mr. Sheehan? Yeah. Mr. Bahu? Yeah. Mr. Ovia? Yeah. Mr. LeMay? Mr. Morin? Yeah. Uh, public appearance. We're going to be suspending the public appearance portion and going right into the meeting. I'd like to start by introducing this year's student representatives, Ms. Karen Vinyl. Superintendent Davis is now going to provide us with a little background info on Karen's many accomplishments throughout her time here at Greater Law. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Karen Vinyl is a resident of Tingsboro and entered Greater Law from Tingsboro Middle School. Karen is a senior majoring in Computer Aided Drafting Design, otherwise known as CAD, and is ranked fifth in her class with an overall average of 4.36. A member of the National Technical Honor Society and National Technical Honor Society, sorry, a, a member of the National Honor Society and National Technical Honor Society, Karen has a rigorous academic schedule which includes advanced placement English literature, advanced placement calculus, and honors physics. Karen has also completed dual enrollment coursework in chemistry through her partnership with Quincy College. Karen has had a variety of work experiences, including a key role on her family's racing team. In fact, she used her CAD skills to design a super modified car wing for her family's race car, which resulted in two wins last season. That's awesome, Karen. She has also worked as a GPS technician for Lee Vinyl Excavation and was selected for the focus program at BAE Systems. A three-year member and captain of our varsity swim and dive team, Karen is also the president of the Greater Old Technical High School Chapter of Skills USA and Skills USA State and National Medalist in Principles of Engineering Technology. In addition, Karen implemented a Skills USA Freshman Outreach Initiative, which earned national recognition in both 2019 and 2020 through the Skills USA Models of Excellence program. Last December, Karen was selected as Student of the Month for her embodiment of our core values through her commitment to community service, outstanding leadership in high academic achievement, and impressive technical proficiency. So we welcome Karen Vinyl as the student representative for the 2021 school year to the school committee. Welcome, Karen. Now I'd like to turn it over to Karen, who will give her first report. As we begin the new year in student activities, we'd like to take a moment to reflect on last year's accomplishments. During the 2019-2020 school year, 210 students were recognized in our Caught Doing Good initiative. 680 students participated in clubs and activities worldwide, and more than 120 students participated in our community service learning programs. Our 2020 Skills USA district competitors were able to take the district test before school closed in March. 190 Greater Lowell students participated in a modified Skills USA District 4 competition where testing took place in our cafeteria. Only one other school, Shaoxing Tech, was able to arrange for a similar school based district testing before all schools were closed. In the modified District 4 competition, our students claimed 32 gold medals, 36 silver medals, and 30 bronze medals with 16 perfect score medallions. 
Although SkillsUSA canceled the 2020 state and national events due to COVID-19, judging for the Chapter Excellence program took place as planned. For the fifth consecutive year, Grid Lowell was rec recognized on the state and national level as a SkillsUSA Gold Level Chapter of Distinction. In addition, for the fourth consecutive year, Greater Lowell was selected as a National Model of Excellence. This past June, Samantha Barnes and myself presented our program to the National Committee through a virtual platform. For the 2020-2021 school year, Greater Lowell student activities will be pilot piloting the feasibility of remote clubs and organizations and assessing which ones can effectively operate in a remote model. SkillsUSA has pledged to return to their regular schedule of activities, events, and competition, even if those events will be conducted in a hybrid or virtual mode. Here at Greater Lowell, we will be creating a remote process for student and staff involvement in SkillsUSA contest, curriculum, and programs. National Honor Society and National Technical Honor Society will be inducting members for the 2020-2021 school year and will be inviting eligible students to apply for membership in the coming weeks. In addition, the following clubs will also be participating in our pilot program. Anime, Drama Club, Yearbook, the Class Planning, class planning Committees, Math Club, and GSA. Finally, we are excited to announce that our 2020 Homecoming Week has been expanded to two weeks to allow more student engagement under our current hi hybrid learning model. Homecoming Weeks will be November 2nd through the 14th and will feature a variety of virtual events to rejuvenate school spirit and Griffin pride. Activities will include a flat Griffin photo contest, name our Griffin competition, spirit days, and election of our homecoming royalty. The week will culminate with the drive through yearbook pickup event for our 2020 graduates. And in athletics, despite facing many challenges this fall, the fall athletic teams who are currently competing have not missed a beat. Nearly 400 students registered to try out for the programs permitted to run this fall. Golf has seen a significant uptick in participation this season, with over 20 athletes trying out for the team. The team has played well in early season matches with Essex Tech and Lowell Catholic. The team will travel to face Shashin on October 14th. Cross Country raced out to a fast start in their meets with Innovation on October 1st and Essex Tech on, November, on October 10th. The team saw over 40 runners come out this season with many promising newcomers to go with a solid group of returners. Boys Soccer had a large number of athletes come out this fall with nearly 60 competing for a spot on the rosters. The team has picked up early season wins over Innovation Academy and Mystic Valley and will host Rashin tomorrow on October 16th. Girls Soccer, who has also had a high number of participants try out, has, seen, has been out to one of its strongest starts in recent memory. The Lady Griffins notched wins over Shaw Sheen, Innovation Academy, Notre Dame Academy, and Lowell Catholic to start the season. They hosted Innovation on October 15th and will travel to face Shaw Sheen on October 16th. Thank you, Karen. Thank you, awesome. Thank you very much. Thank you, Karen, and welcome. Thank you. Welcome. Great work. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, in a motion to approve the uh, minutes of the September 10th. So moved. Mr. Tatsios. Mr. Sheehan. Mr. Tatsios? Yes. Mr. Kiki? Yes. Mr. Gitchia? Yes. Mr. Sheehan? Yes. Mr. Bahu? Yes. Mr. O'Hare? Mr. O'Hare? Yes. Mr. Yes. yes. Mr. Lurie? Yes. Mr. Morris? Yes. yes. I uh, need approval to approve the minutes for the September 17th meeting. So moved, Mr. Chairman. Okay. Seconded by Mr. Barrow. Mr. Tatsius? Yes. Mr. Gigi? Yes. Mr. Gitsia? Yes. Mr. Sheehan? Yes. Mr. Bahu? Yes. Mr. Ohia? Yes. Mr. LeMay? Yes. Mr. Morin? Yes. Report of the Treasurer. Motion to waive the reading. Yeah, motion to waive. I think he's on the line. Second. Mr. Yeah. Mr. Tatius? Yes. Mr. Gigi? Yes. Mr. Gitchia? Yes. Mr. Sheehan? Yes. Mr. Bahu? Yes. Mr. O'Hare? 
Yes. Mr. LeMay? Yes. Mr. Mormon? Yes. Uh, I need a motion to approve the expenditures of four million thirty thousand two hundred and seventy dollars and thirty nine cents. Second. Mr. Tatius? Yes. Second. Mr. Giggy? Yes. Mr. Gitchia? Yes. Mr. Sheehan? Yes. Mr. Bahu? Yes. Mr. O'Hare? Yes. Mr. LeMay? Yes. Mr. Morin? Yes. Board of General Counsel? No. Yes. Superintendent's report. Sure. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. First item on my agenda, I'd like to inform the committee that Greater Lowell Technical High School has been awarded a $20,000 grant to support machining and engineering students from the Gene Haas Foundation. The grant award can be used for scholarships up to $2,500 per person for manufacturing and engineering students, tool awards, NIMS credentialing, and SkillsUSA CNC machining. Uh, the second item on the agenda is the Cooperative Education Report. Uh, we currently have 54 senior students participating on, uh, in our Cooperative Education Program as of September 30th, and I think you have a report in your packet. This represents 10.8% of the class of 2020-21. A copy of the report is in your packet, and I'd like to note that we are still unable to place early childhood education students out on co-op based on the current state guidelines at this time. However, uh, all of our other students uh, can continue with the cooperative opportunities, including the uh, health students that are out on co-op. My next item on the agenda, I'd like to uh, ask uh, Ms. Lisa Martinez, our Director of Technology, Enrollment, and Information, to join us to provide the committee with an update on the FY21 enrollment. Hello. Hey. Should we dim the lights a little? Hey, good evening, everyone. Nice to see everyone. Nice to see you. Thank you. Um, I'm here to provide you with uh, an admissions enrollment update, so uh, we can get started with that. So uh, the first thing is our admissions plan criteria is located on our website at uh, gltech.org under the admissions tab. And it's um, actually um, provided in four languages, English, Khmer, Portuguese, and Spanish. So it's still, still there as well, as well as uh, the criteria. Okay, the, the first indicator, progress indicator, I'd like to talk about the uh, grade 9 applicants. As you can see, um, this is the five-year for our February numbers, uh, which are provided for the deadline for the first round of applicants. And if, um, as you can see, uh, for this uh, past year, uh, it was 1,074, and which is an increase of, uh, of 124 students from 950 from the prior year, as well as our final October 1 numbers. And you'll see that it was, there was an increase uh, this year to 1,172 uh, applicants, up from 80, 80 uh, students from the prior year. Okay, that's for our grade 9 applicants. Next progress indicator I, I'd like to um, take a look at is our grade 9 acceptances. And you'll see uh, we had 681 acceptances, and the prior year we had 683. That's always a little bit different depending on how many students apply and what the cutoff scores are. So, And then uh, if you look here, we have our October first numbers and uh, additional acceptances after our February were 73. So we add that for the 681? So, yes. So we would add, we would add that, yes. 
So, so, so we took in 754 students this year. So what would happen is um, when we get to the next slide, you'll see how many declines we had and completes as well as waitlisted students. Terrific. Thank okay. So for our next indicator, we have our grade nine declines and completes, et cetera. And again, uh, we had last year we had 148. That changes from year to year up to uh, 226. And again, that number increased uh, certainly because we had more applicants. Then we had our grade nine waitlisted students, and this is as of October one. Uh, we had 350 students on our waitlist, and again, that's up from 262 this year. And uh, again, we had more applicants as well, and um, which which would um, explain the increase for this year. And that's just for freshmen, huh? That's just for freshmen. That is that's a stifling number. It is. Next progress indicator is our grade 10 acceptances. Last year, um, we, we've increased. We went from 17 to 20. Uh, and then this year, we had one acceptance. And the reason for that is not many. Um, we had a decrease in withdrawals uh, over all grades uh, last year, so we were only un we were only able to accept one tenth grade student this year, as of October one. The wait list for tenth grade students uh, as of October one was fifty five students. So new for this year. We actually have, uh, and moving forward, there's a new DESE state reporting for our waitlist. And uh, we now have to upload our waitlist to DESE, um, and, and that's due in November uh, of this year. And we actually need to, to upload quite a bit of uh, data collection. For grades 9 and 10, we'll have to uh, upload all the student data for all of the indicators that, uh, that I had um, just recently reviewed with you, as well as the component scores and how we, we got to those scores. Applicant eligibility and supporting data all needs to be uploaded, as well as the admission waitlist and the supporting data of why students were accepted or why they declined or why they were waitlisted. So that, um, that we, this is the first year we'll be doing that. And then, uh, I also have the enrollment report uh, for for our um, for October one numbers and for grade nine we have 596 students uh, as of October one for grade 10 584 students for grade 11 561 students and for grade 12 uh, 538 students uh, as well as our special programs 18 students for a total of 2,297 2, students. Does anybody have any questions? Uh, Lisa, uh, back to page three. I'm just sort of um, getting a little confused. As far as the progress indicator goes, you have uh, 681 students were accepted, and then it looks like 73 more were, were accepted. Um, so, did, were some of those 681, did they sort of decline uh, admission here, and then we had a, we were allowed to accept more students? Is that what Exactly, that exactly. So, over the course of um, when we have the initial acceptances in March, um, many of the students over the summer, we do uh, quite a bit of family outreach, as well as uh, um, to uh, f find out if the students are actually going planning to attend Greater Lowell. And some, some, sometimes um, they, they don't necessarily register. We then um, go up, also go to their homes. So some students decline. Some students have applications that were incomplete. Some, um, some of the students uh, moved. And so during that summer, then we're able to accept students once they de decline. Great. And of those 73, um, were they part of the 350 that are waitlisted? Yes. And so, so, so the wait list is actually three hundred and fifty minus seventy three. Is that yes, correct? Yes, that is correct. Okay. So, our wait list is somehow going down. Going down. And are we backfilling these things? The students say they're not able to come here and such. Yes, That's we, a we do. It's constant. We have um, uh, the the enrollment, the constant enrollment. Yes. Okay. Great. Thank you. 
rolling rolling emissions. Yes. So, so we seem to follow them right through the whole process. Uh, it, it looks like as far as once once they like the ones from Lowell that end up at Lowell High or whatever, we follow them right through. Yes. Yes, yeah, so and what we do is um, for, for parents who may have not registered, uh, we, we actually follow through with them. We, with uh, the family e outreach through phone calls, through um, actually home visits, and to, to make sure that the students um, are, are not, um, say there's not a language barrier or something. We, we do everything possible to have the students register, and then often they, they, they make um, adjustments at the last minute, either attend their district school or they move, or they um, choose to um, attend elsewhere. I, sen I sense that they're very appreciative of, the, of that process and the follow-ups and everything, whether there's a language barrier or not. Yes. Um, it, it's, it, it's really helpful because um, they, often there is a language barrier and, and for some reason they, they, they may have not been able to uh, navigate the registration process. We also um, uh, work with our, our sending school uh, guidance counselors um, uh, in case we need phone numbers or address changes and, and things like that. Well, my hat's off to you and your staff and guidance and everybody included uh, the job that you're doing on that. Thank you. Thank you, Lisa. You're welcome. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. So the next item I have on the agenda is I would like to ask Mr. Michael Barton, our Assistant Superintendent Principal, uh, to join us to present uh, the Health and Safety Plan to the Committee for approval. Good evening, everyone. The health and safety plan, I'll just get my notes here. The health and safety plan is a document that's renewed every three years. So it's up for renewal in uh, the fall of 2020. Uh, just an overview of the document. Um, the document contains policies and procedures in terms of instructor responsibilities, general student safety, and accident injury procedures to avoid occupational accidents. Uh, it includes the reporting the role of the school nurse and specific measures for things such as blood uh, borne precautions, asbestos, and uh, provides details and overall record keeping. Um, it also describes various health and safety committees, including the safety steering committee, which is the key committee in the school. Uh, one of the changes this year is, or certainly with this plan, uh, the update of this plan, is to include in the safety steering committee the athletic director and the school nurse. Uh, in order to provide a bigger panoramic uh, inclusion of different things that happen in the school, including sports activities, and then the perspective of the school nurse. Uh, lastly, it includes a description of how documents associated with respirators—excuse me—respirators uh, are to be handled and maintained. So, the biggest update by far in the safety plan is the respiratory protection program. So. Um, as you can see there, the RPP provides guidelines that are designed to help reduce employees and students' exposure to occupational air contaminants, uh, chemicals in the air, uh, and also to provide for uh, prevention of oxygen deficiency when students are working in things such as masonry, uh, auto collision, carpentry, uh, shops where respirators are used and employed. So it, it includes descriptions of types of respirators, how they're made to be used in the school. It provides details on the program administrator and his role, which happens to be Artie Cornelia, the supervisor of the transportation manufacturing uh, cluster. Um, it also includes um, details on what to do if there's a malfunction or damage to the respirator. And it also includes a medical evaluation questionnaire that needs to be filled out by students before they can uh, even begin to handle a respirator or operate one. Uh, and that document needs to be signed by parents and turned into the school nurse. So overall, uh, the major changes are the inclusion of the nurse and the athletic director in the safety steering committee and the update to the respiratory protection program. Any questions? Yeah. Motion to approve. Okay. Mr. Cassius? Yes. Mr. Gigi? Yes. Mr. Gitchia? Yes. Mr. Sheehan? Yes. Mr. Bahu? Yes. Mr. Ogier? Here. Mr. LeMay? 
Yes. Mr. Mori. Yes. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Reported the business manager. Well, I'm thank you. Uh, I still have another item on the agenda. Oh, you do? Yeah, I do. So, uh, my last and final item on the agenda is to provide you with an update on the current uh, health metrics and our reopening plan and where we are in regards to uh, making a decision regarding our current instructional uh, model. So as we continue to monitor the public health conditions in our key municipality, which is Lowell, and under the guidance provided by the Department of Elementary and Secondary Education, the Department of Public Health, and in consultation with our local health department, which would be the city as low as well as the town of Tingsboro, I wanted to provide you with an update on uh, the decision to transition to a full remote instructional model beginning Monday, October 19th. So over the last several weeks, we've uh, been paying close attention and monitoring the COVID-19 weekly public health report, as well as monitoring identified close contacts, symptomatic in individuals, and confirmed uh, COVID-19 cases of individuals within our school community. Uh, currently, the public health data for the city of Lowell uh, is indicating an increasing trend in the average daily rate of number of cases which uh, has gone from 7.9 uh, to 16.4 currently, uh, which uh, this has doubled uh, the threshold number over the last several weeks. The public health data in the city of Lowell is also indicating a trend in, in the percent positivity rate. Uh, when we started school, the percent positivity rate was at 1.98, and currently it is at 3.29, which is, again, uh, one of the highest, among the highest positivity rates uh, in the state. Uh, Greater Lowell Technical High School has seen an increase in the number of close contacts, symptomatic individuals, and positive COVID cases uh, within our school community over the, over the last several weeks as well. Uh, in addition, in consultation with the local Board of Health, uh, they have recommended that we, can, we look at uh, using three weeks of data. They believe that this is a, a, an appropriate threshold period of reports and uh, support uh, our decision to transition to a, uh, a full remote learning model. Uh, they, they agree that the data is currently reflective of a trend. Uh, they also, in discussion with them in regards to the data, that the data reflects uh, a community spread and, and it's not isolated to one demographic as, uh, as it was when we began in March, uh, where in March we saw some outbreaks in nursing homes. Uh, now the, uh, the spread is more, uh, more throughout in, in several different uh, age groups. As the public health data continues to indicate a spread in, in, in the community, uh, our participation numbers in our hybrid learning model have decreased as well. More students are currently shifting to full remote learning. Currently, we have 400, approximately 450 families who have requested to switch to full remote learning. And at the start of school, we had approximately 150. This spiked uh, when we had our first uh, first indication of being in the red and then spiked again when we had our first case and uh, as the weeks uh, as the weeks go on they continue to come in uh, more families requesting to be full remote. Uh, I, I believe all the decisions that have been made currently during the COVID-19 pandemic have been very, very difficult decisions to make, but have been made with the health and well-being of our students and staff at the forefront of our minds and will continue to be that way. Uh, Greater Lowell Technical High School's reopening plan, which was approved by the committee, was, a, was designed specifically to be flexible, to move to these different instructional models as necessary based on the guidelines provided by the public health department mm -hmm. and uh, the health metric. Uh, as well as the guidelines provided by the Department of Elementary and Secondary Education. 
at this time, uh, moving forward to a full remote learning is the safest learning environment for students, staff, families, and our community at large to help be proactive to prevent uh, the spread. Uh, do I have any questions? Yes. So I know we're prepared just as well to that. I'm just wondering, what, what is the protocol or the governor's ruling relative to when we can revert back? Does it need to be one week data? Two weeks? How is that? So just to just to be clear, uh, Mr. LeMay, it's not the government's uh, decision. This is not help. a government. It's it's based on the Department of Education and the public health metric, and they are advising that we follow the same guidelines that we use to transition to full remote, that we look at three weeks of data, and three weeks of data are reflective of a month of a month of change. Uh, which, which would establish some sort of a trend, if there would be one. So we're, we're uh, at least prepared for the next several weeks. Yeah, so we're, we're prepared to move yeah. forward. I think our reopening plan, I, as I said, was designed with the flexibility yeah. uh, so that we can transition to and from uh, different instructional modes as we, as we see necessary based on the public health situation. I followed Lowell closely um, through the manager's office as far as uh, dispersing information, and I, I found that uh, last night. So I guess it I didn't look forward to it, but I, I guess we expected something down the road. But I, I still say that we've been more than prepared for whatever's come across our door. Um, I, I think we stand ready to accept people back as soon as the numbers go down. Yeah, I think we've been proactive. Yes, Mr. Kiki. Well, I think everybody on this committee believes that the health and safety of the students and the teachers and the administration is first and foremost. It's very unfortunate that there is a rise or an increase that I don't think any one of us really can prevent at the present time. It's unfortunate and sad that the students are the ones that are truly suffering. They're here for a vocational education and we can't give it to them in the full capacity that we want to. Um, I saw recently the litigation initiated in Boston um, and the judges that particular judge cited on the side that remote learning probably wasn't in the best interest and the numbers have been ticking up. So as a committee, it's, I guess we have to make that decision to kind of to um, move in a, a safe and prudent and the balance, it's a balancing test right now. <laughs> and I, I don't know if I agree wholeheartedly, that's a personal belief, with the numbers that are being presented, 7.9 to 16.4. The demographics, um, there are 6.3 million residents in the state of Massachusetts. And somewhere I saw there were 10,000 cases. That's a very low percentage within the entire state. It tends to migrate to the highly populated, densely populated areas for which Lowell is one of them even though we sit in Tingsboro, but a majority of our students do come from the popular, dense area. And I will defer to the administration and the committee on how they want to proceed, but it's a delicate balancing, and I'm not convinced that we're really doing the students a service here, balancing out the risk. But if we lost one student to this, none of us could live with ourselves. So it's a, it's a tough call, tough call. And it is increasing. It is increasing throughout the state from everywhere you're reading. It's even increasing with our border state, Nashua, New Hampshire is on the, the red. And so this area is prone to a problem, I guess. We got to kind of curtail it and see what we can do going forward. 
I, you know, I think my heart breaks for the seniors this year because it, there's no, you know, they have no control over it. I think, you know, Jill and her administration are doing a fantastic job. This is just, it's a, it's a, it's a lose-lose situation for everybody. Um, you had mentioned, uh, what, was Desi finally getting involved? Like before, it was, you do whatever. Now, what are they, like, what, they want to report or something like that, or? Oh, oh no, no, no. Uh, yes, we do have to report our cases. Oh, I'm sorry. We do have to report our cases on a weekly basis, yeah. so they are keeping uh, track and monitoring our, our cases and helping supporting us with making decisions uh, in the best interest of our students and our communities. Is there a possibility that we might be able to offer like summer school to some of these technical areas? Because, you know, like some of these kids, they need their hours nope. in order to go to start like an apprenticeship or you know, whatever technical, uh, you know, shop they're in. Like I said, it, it, and it's not, and again, uh, my hat's off to the administration. It's, everybody's hands, it's, it's a lose-lose situation. So myself and the assistant uh, superintendent were just talking about this yesterday in regards to uh, doing some summer boot camps for technical programs and invite students in in the summer if we can get the teachers available to be able to provide some, uh, I call them boot camps, where you can uh, catch up on the skills that you might have not have been able to practice uh, during the school year. Uh, we are going to continue to uh, offer cooperative education for those students who have been in person uh, since school started and are, are out on co-op. They'll, they'll have the opportunity to co continue to stay out in co-op uh, unless the public health conditions change, uh, with the exception of our early childhood students who are uh, unable to go out on co-op right now because that because of the fact that we're in the red and some of the early childhood centers that they might w work at are in the red as well. And that direction is also provided under the, under the Department of Elementary and Secondary Education. So we're doing our best to get our, our students out there uh, as, as, as much as we can, uh, knowing that our employers have to also commit to being able to provide health and safety for our students and follow the COVID-19 recommendations that uh, DESE uh, provided us with. The thing is, is whenever DESE makes a suggestion, it's for the general type education and not so much for the vocational side of education. So we get hauled into this global general ed education kind of model when in fact we are a different educational model and how do we push back and how can we push back to say that it's very important for our students to be in school learning their skills so so we have uh, been in contact with that Desi the uh, Center for Career and Vocational Technical Education has meetings every Monday with uh, superintendents, assistant superintendents uh, across the state to discuss some of the issues in regards to vocational education. Uh, again, they're supporting our continuing co-op. Uh, they've provided us some online resources and they're working the best that they can to help uh, support us as vocational technical schools because it is difficult to provide a hands-on education when uh, you don't have the opportunity to uh, provide that time. Okay, and the next question, just to follow up, you're mentioning the boot camps and so forth. Where in our budget is that going to come from? Because the teachers are going to probably want to get compensated for that time. And if there is room in the budget, can we do it in the evenings and kind of spread it out through the entire a day sooner than the summers. So, uh, yep, we can, after we get through <laughs> COVID and if the community spread uh, declines, we can continue to try to offer things in the night uh, on weekends whenever we can. As far as the budget goes, DESE and the state are providing more funding uh, for schools. Uh, during COVID, so we could use some of that funding to supplement uh, the, 
the skills for our students. We did receive a grant, uh, so we do have some funding to provide some uh, additional, maybe during vacation weeks, if students want to come, weekends if they would like to. to. So uh, we, we just started talking about that yeah. uh, yesterday, literally, to say how can we pro be proactive and what can we start to do to give them another opportunity when the time comes outside of the school day to maybe earn some of that extra that, uh, earn those skills and learn those skills yeah, so they'll this, be ready. Yeah, this model doesn't only hurt our kids vocationally. It's hard on the parents. You mm -hmm. know, they're at home trying to get the child up to watch a computer. That's a challenge, especially when it's educational. If it's their friends or a video game, not so difficult. But education-wise, I observed it in person this past week with my own family uh, remote learning from Maryland. And I saw my nephew sleeping with the computer on. I find, you know, I think he's not un unlike some of the other students. So these are very challenging times for everyone, and we appreciate our parents. We, we, we know it's very difficult for, for our parents. We, we understand it's difficult for our students, and we're trying to provide the best that we can for them under, under the current circumstances. We're committed to do that, and we will continue to do the best that the best that we can under the circumstances. And I, I truly believe that as a school we have, we were able to open school, we were able to get students in person in learning. Uh, and unfortunately, uh, due to something that's currently out of our control, uh, but we will continue to provide them uh, an education through remote learning the best that we can. Okay. So we would like the community to know that we are attempting to balance safety with education and we're doing what we can and if anybody wants to send any suggestions in we're welcome to receive those inputs mm -hmm. yes mr Bajo. i just want to take my face mask off uh, so our numbers went from 7.9 to 16.4 in basically a month and what is that 16.4 is that per hundred thousand in the Yes, it is. Area. No. Yeah. It's per thousand, I think. Per hundred thousand. It's per one hundred thousand. Yes. Mm -hmm. And we've had about, we've been open about four weeks now. You're telling me 450 families are choosing uh, not to send their student. Mm -hmm. And that, that seems to be increasing each week. I'm sure it is. Um, how many cases have we had from the student body in the building? Can I just speak about, sure, three. Three, confirmed. Yes. Listen, it's all about, you know, the safety of not only our students, but of the families that, you know, they go home to on a daily basis. And the last thing we want to do is um, add to this pandemic. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> we all know what my feeling is on trying to educate students in person. Um, and I know this is, unfortunately, a school closing seems inevitable. Um, and I, I guess realistically we have to look at the rotating number of weeks. And when we see one yellow week, it doesn't necessarily mean we can open, does it? It does not. What? We would we would need to look for three consecutive weeks of a yellow or a green, to to and look at the data closely, to be able to reopen. Yes. So if we went to yellow, yellow red, yellow yellow red. Well, depending just, if we, we were yellow yellow and then red because of an outbreak in a nursing home, that would be a discussion that we would have because it really wouldn't be a community spread. Right, but we don't know if it's outbreaks in nursing homes. Do we know? Is, is well, the, currently, we'll currently, right things? now, based on a discussion with the Department of Public Health, it's not cases are not significant. There's not evidence of that, like there was in March. You know, the data currently in Lowell shows it's it's really currently right now. 
uh, within the age range of 0 to 19 and then between 30 and 39 is, is pretty high for this week. So the 0 to 19 numbers are higher than they have been? Is that what I'm hearing? According to this week's report, it's reflective of 22% of the cases in Lowell. No? No. Uh, go ahead. How many cases? How many cases are in Lowell right now? How many cases you, are in Lowell? Do you know? You're saying 22. Yeah, I do. Yeah. So, if uh, are you want me to look at the Lowell report or the state report? I think the the Lowell report. The Lowell report, oh, yeah. 205. It's 205, and 20 percent mm -hmm. are zero to 19 years old. 40. 22 percent. So about 40 cases. 45. 45. And of course, those are all, those are all school age students and such like that. And we don't know if they go to Lowell High, Greater Lowell Tech, or a private school. But, you know, it's all about the pandemic. And so this is something we can look at, I guess, a few weeks from now. So every week, um, we're monitoring the data very closely every week. Every Thursday morning, myself, the assistant superintendent, the school nurses, the director of guidance, and the director of human resources meets and takes a good look at this data and has discussions. We also look at our... Uh, uh, close contact tracking or symptom tracking within the building and positive cases. And that's th those are the discussions that we have every Thursday morning, and we'll continue, continue to do that and uh, watch the data. If we have three weeks where um, driving city Lowell, I guess, drops from the red to yellow, mm -hmm. and we have three yellows, does that mean in the, the fourth week we can go in school. That means after that third yellow you can start. In school. Yes. And are we capable of doing it that quickly from remote to back to in school? So, yeah. So basically we designed our reopening plan to be flexible to be able to do that. Uh, and our hope is that when we are able to transition out of this, that we will actually be able to start in-person learning two days for our grade uh, 10 through 12 students as we committed to based on our reopening plan. We, we have everything uh, prepared for that. Uh, we were headed to, to be able to do that as we committed to in our reopening plan. So uh, if when we transition back to uh, in-person learning or a hybrid form of in-person learning, we'll be able to provide two days of in-person learning for our grade 10 through 12 students as in our, that would be hybrid mode B as we proposed uh, in our reopening plan to occur at the end of quarter one. So what I'm hearing is we don't actually have to have a school committee meeting to do that because we've already said that's our plan. Yes. Mm -hmm. And so this school is going full remote special needs as well? Uh, no. So this, the students with significant disabilities will be coming to school. Okay, well, the, department is, the department is asking that we continue to provide services for those students. And what we, makes them any different other than their need? We are committed to do that. For health and safety. I would ask that question to the Department of Elementary and Secondary Education. They asked us to prioritize learning for those students, and we'll continue to provide learning for them as long as the health and safety conditions provide uh, provide us uh, to doing that. Because so the state's saying it's not safe for them right now, so we're putting them at risk. Yet taking our vocational students and saying they they have a high need too to be in school. And we're taking them out of the equation. And it seems like there's some... Because they have the same risk as any other student in the school. But they also have a higher need, uh, higher needs to be able to uh, address, to be able to access education. And it's an equity issue in regards to accessing education. Yeah, it's that same argument, though, because DESE does the general education for the entire state. So now you have the general population, the general, we'll call it the, the regular school. And then 
The vocational school gets just sucked into that side of it. Yet, then we have this group over here where we say, well, you have greater needs. You have to come. And I think the vocational education falls into that greater needs, too. They should be coming. Um, and, it, and again, it's that balance. And it, it, it's whatever group is voicing their frustration with what's going on gets the attention. And we need to keep advocating for the vocational kids to be in school. Of those special needs students, how many, how many are there? There's 60. The 60. But all 60 have not committed to coming in. And they, so 29 out of the 60 have committed to coming to school. And they come in every day? Yes, they do. With the exception of Wednesdays, which is a deep clean. A deep clean. They have since we started school. Okay, so we're going to a full hybrid starting no, full, full remote. remote. Full remote starting on Monday. Mm -hmm. Starting on Monday. And how about the athletic programs? So the athletic programs, we are going to seek advisement from MIAA if our, our student athletes can complete the fall season that they started. That would be their decision. But we're going to advocate that they do continue to, uh, to participate in athletics and finish the fall season. Is, is that what other school districts are doing? I'm not sure what other school districts are doing, I but I heard today Wolves can try to continue to play. But uh, we will advocate, and uh, and I will advocate at the MIAA. I'm not sure if it's going to be possible, but we will do what we can to seek and find out if it is. So, what would be that? I, I guess my guess would be, if we're playing Shawshin Tech, our uh, athletic director may call Shawshin Tech and say, are you playing soccer this week? And they sort of... Answer. So I think there's a game schedule set up right now that they're, they, they are scheduled to complete. It's just a matter of if the MIAA will allow us to complete now that we are uh, full remote. So essentially it's the MIAA, MIAA's call. Yep, they set the regulations the in regards to that, and we're, we're going to advocate. And uh, as long as we, as a board and as a school, support our student athletes continuing to to participate in sports, I will discuss that with the MIA and say that as a board and as a school community, we, we continue to support the completion of our fall athletes with fall sports, and uh, we'll see what their decision is. Okay. Mr. Giga, you spoke about your uh, family down in Maryland doing remote learning. I was um, with them this week. That's I can why. talk about my family you know, right here in Lowell. It's, you know, teaching, you know, and they get very frustrating teaching, frustrated teaching from home. So would our, would our teachers have the opportunity to come into the building? Yes, our teachers will, are going to be able to have the opportunity to come into the building. So it's based on if they're comfortable, it's based on if they want to, how does that work? So it's going to be an option if they choose to come into the building to teach, yes. Okay, well, thank you. No more, no, no more questions, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Uh, I guess this question is directed to you, <coughs> Jill. Mm -hmm. uh, would... Uh, Ask my colleagues maybe to uh, jump in after, but I can only speak for Lowell, being representative of Lowell. And what what is happening as far as uh, the man at the city manager's office? Information gets deciphered pretty good mm -hmm. from what I see, because I'm involved in a few other things. Uh, but the neighborhood groups, they are, all the all the neighborhoods have a group now mm -hmm. and. The flow of information to these groups through the city manager's office, her liaison, is very, very good. Uh, to the point that I was just wondering, I know you deal with the Board of Health, but do you have a, uh, a contact for the other towns relative to how that how does that all sure, work? Sure, so the key municipality that the Department of Education has directed us to, to follow is Lowell. So I have been in constant contact with uh, 
with the head of the Lowell Department of Health. Yeah. I've also been in contact as early as about two hours ago and early this morning with uh, a representative from the town of Tingsboro. So we speak often, and they are uh, helping me uh, analyze the data, and uh, I appreciate their support, yeah. and they are inform informing me in regards to the data. I was just wondering, because all the towns have a board of health too, so, yes. so I was just wondering to what degree that they would, thank you. Thank you. how you're collaborating. So, so usually because we reside in Tingsboro, I would be communicating with the town of Tingsboro, okay. but yeah. because Sounds the Department good. of Education has dictated Lowell as our key municipality, I have been in more contact with the Department of Health, Lowell Department of Health. However, I still am in contact with the Department of Health in Tingsboro as well. And Desi has also assigned a liaison uh, to support superintendents uh, and, and, and guide them uh, through, through this time in making difficult decisions when it comes to the health metric and uh, a mode of instruction for their school community. Thank you very much. You're welcome. So I just want you, I want you to know this is not directly towards you. I'm just frustrated, um, very frustrated. So Desi in the beginning, we have over 350 plans across the state. They're spineless, they're gutless. They haven't done anything to help us at all. We come into a school reopening plan two weeks before school. We approve it. We come to an MOU with the teachers before school. And by the way, I want to thank you, the administration, the teachers, Maintenance, everybody in the school. We did everything. I was out at the soccer field today. Parents out there, staffs out there, thanking us for everything we did to, you know, start school properly. We we made our effort. We did it. I disagree with Desi, but I support your decision. Um, it, it, it's it's tough. Desi goes by a community. Can we agree on that? Sixteen point. It was seven point nine, sixteen three, sixteen four. The last three weeks. Mm -hmm. Okay. They never break it down to school-age children. And Joanne over at the healthcare, and I'll, I'll tell you, I know I, Jill's constant contact because I've talked to Jill, uh, Joanne at the health department, I've talked to Kerry, Tingsboro, I've talked to Dave and Drake. Usually we're one right after each other. And I, my total question to them was the kids. I don't, and don't take this the wrong way, I, I'm speaking for me. My job as a committee member is to educate the kids, take care of the kids, the teacher, the building. I, I'm, and I, people, I'm going to get ripped for saying this. I'm not worried about ya, ya, gam, gam, grammar at the house. That's the parent's house, the parent. This school, if we have after Wednesday, Captain, you brought it up. Let's, let's go through the school. We test positive COVID. We know that's not doable. We had that with Mark last, last, uh, last month. This school doesn't have COVID. The people coming into the school have COVID. It's the parents' responsibility to keep COVID out of the school. It's our responsibility to educate these kids. Now, let's go through with Desi, the last three weeks. Under 19, the three weeks ago, 13 positives, 7,000 tests, 0 .1, 0 0.18. The health department loaded and break it down to age group up until two weeks ago. So let's really get into these numbers that Desi doesn't want to get into. They want to use the 60s through 80s. 50 through 80s. You know what? I don't care about that. They're not in the school. I realize we have teachers in that age group. The teachers need to be vigilant just like I need to be vigilant to walk into the school. It's common sense. Two weeks ago, 0 through 10, this is the age group, 18 tested positive out of 40 in low. So that's 22. 22. Now, if I really break it down, I have it in front of me. 11 to 14, 12. <laughs> We have 14-year-old freshmen. We have some 13-year-old freshmen, so I'll include those numbers. 8,000 tests in the city of Lowell, 8322, mm -hmm. for a .26. Let's go to this week. There was 45 total, 16 positives between the 0 and 10. Let's cut it down to 29. We 9,568 tests, .3%. Is that age group really going up rocketing like Desi said? It's really not. I'm 0.12 off. It's really not going up. And I, I'm, I'm venting. I, I'm, I'm actually pissed off. It's just we're doing a disservice to these kids. 
Never mind the seniors. How about the juniors that didn't go to shop for March? And I know, I know you feel So I right? think the bottom line is how do you create a balance and where do you draw the line when it comes to health and safety? Well, and I'm just going to put it right out there. No, no, I'm, I'm going to put you. it right out there. Where do you draw the line when it comes to health and safety? There was, a gu there was a guide that was put out, a metric, a health metric that was put out by DESE and the Department of Public Health. The health metric says when you have three consecutive weeks that you need to really look at your data and you need to really decide on if you want to move to 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 a full uh, remote learning mode so if where do you draw the line then if three weeks of data that's showing an increasing trend isn't enough where do you draw the line do you wait till you have an outbreak in school do you wait till till, till something bad, bad happens or you do or do you draw the line and say right now there is a risk there is evidence of a, of, of a spread in the community why don't we be safe why don't we be safe? Joe, I back your decision, but is there really, really a rocket ship in the under eight, 19 years old? Under, under 19? There's not. The data's right there. Desi wants to use the community, and you know what? Fine. They, they were useless in the beginning. They're useless now. It's not you. I support what you're saying. One kid is too many. One kid. If one kid gets sick and unfortunately something happens to them, I don't know what I'd be able to do. I sit in this committee. I support your decision. My problems with Desi, they weren't there from the beginning, neither was Gov Governor Faker. Not Faker anymore, he's Faker. Where was he? He wasn't there in the beginning. There was no guidelines set for anybody back in March. Nobody knows what they're talking about back in March. If we look now, back to March, they're wrong. Nobody really knows what this does. And you know what? I'm, I'm fine with error on, the side of, on this side. I'm, I'm fine with that. And, and I, I think with the increase in spread across the state of Massachusetts, mm -hmm. just in the last week, there's, I, I think, 63 more communities in red. I, I get it. I get it. Maybe we should serve French fries to all the kids that walk through the door. It's a COVID killer. I, I don't know. what I'm just frustrated. Well, I, I just think we're, we're not. I'm, I'm not saying us. I'm saying as a society, as a board, we, we did everything possible we could. And I believe that we have done everything possible that we I'm could. just frustrated. And I believe we'll continue to do everything we possible, everything possible that we could at the same time ensuring the health and safety of our students, our staff, and our families. Are we really doing that? They can do sports. That's managed by a whole different organization. Sports isn't shut down and have to do it remote. Well, I, you know, sports, sports is outside. Right now, like I went to the soccer game today. There's outside, there's people, you know, they're spread out. The MIA gave guidelines. I, I watched the girls' soccer game today. By the way, we won. Great job by the coaches. It's a great game. It was senior. Senior day. It was unreal. I, you know, it's, it was great watching. So I'm not sure the guidelines of MIA will let us continue. It's recommended by the board that I... I advocate and ask if sports could continue. I'm not sure. I'm not sure if it's going to be possible. But I said uh, that I would advocate to for sports to continue if that was the issue because it, it's outside and the season is almost over. It's it's. Is they're putting sports higher than education now? Well, they're not. They're not, and I don't want in to, here, and I don't want that to appear that way. I'll, I'll, well, that's me. I. I yeah. Before before the meeting, I, I was outside and I said to Jill, we have four games left. We already started the season. Uh, they're not going to schools. They're getting on the bus. It's our kids and going to play outside. We're following the um, MIA guidelines, five feet. I, I watched, uh, I don't even know what I'm talking about, soccer. We, they drop the ball. You can't come within 10 feet of the kid kicking the ball. Um, I just thought no, we should take care of these kids and at least let them finish the season. It's the right thing to do. It, we got to give them some normalcy, I guess. But there's got to be something that we have to give these kids. And I'm, we're doing everything possible, Jill. I, and I'm not directing it towards you. I support your decision 100. Mm percent -hmm. I'm just frustrated that they didn't step in and give us guidelines from the get-go because we wouldn't be in this position if they did. They chose to give 350 school districts their own options. Mm -hmm. uh, and I'm sorry, Belcher Town is not law. Uh, Fall River is not low. I mean, we can go down the river to Lawrence. They haven't opened school up at all in Lawrence, but Central's playing. Well, that's yeah. a private school. Uh, I, I realize they're not by Desi, but they're, they're by the MIAA. We have low kids playing on their team, so 
I, I would hope the MIA sees that and says, hey, we can finish the season. And, and that, Captain, that was all me. It wasn't Jill. I, I didn't know Freddie was going to bring up the athletic piece of it. Right. I'm as frustrated as Lee is here. Is I don't know what the percentage is that the kids are testing positive or they have it, but a hundred percent of these kids are not getting an education. And and I no, I know you're doing the best job that you can. And every, you don't have um, the power to do everything. We have to go by Desi's rules, the state, and all that. But nevertheless, we're not giving these kids an education. That's why we're here. A hundred percent of them. Well, I think we're continuing to, to give them an education because I would think what teachers are doing every day, whether that be in person here or in remote, is providing them with the best education that they can every day. I, I'm not going to take that away from, from the teachers because they are trying to provide them under the current circumstances with the best education that we can com provide while still trying to implement the safety protocols that were set. I understand. It, it, these are very, very difficult decisions. They, they are, they very, are difficult. very, very I, difficult decisions. I, I just think that... Um, from the state level and the federal level, we're not getting the uh, freedom to do what uh, we, what each individual uh, district would like to do. Well, I think it's it's guidance, and we have the freedom to make a decision. Mm -hmm. We do have the freedom under the guidance under the guidance that they have provided. Yeah, but if we if we deviate from that guidance and it's the wrong decision, are we really free to decide? Well, Mr. Kiki, I uh... so I think they they're setting the rules here right at the moment, and I think to lease, they basically didn't have the manpower or the ability to deal with the pandemic. So what they did is they deferred it as far out as they could, and see what each district was able to put together. And now that they've seen all the different plans, they have a model that they're going to try to push down our throat uh, into the future. And maybe the next pandemic, um, they'll have a better grasp on how to handle it, but it's truly unprecedented and the kids are suffering. We've got to get them back to school. And to Lee's thing there, those numbers are not that scary in that age group. They're just not mandating remote learning. Well, we, we do have an increase of families that are choosing remote learning uh, for health and safety reasons. And like I said, that is increasing. We started out with approximately 150 and it's doubled and it continues to go up as the weeks go on because of what's going on. Again, fear is running people's lives or they're taking advantage if their employer says, if you have a reason to be home, you can work at home. Your reason now is the kids are remote learning, so now we have to be home. So fear is starting to take over here, and we have to be cognizant of that too. And again, we're balancing it, and at this time, we already said this plan was what we were going to adopt in the beginning of the year. So I don't think we can change it, but I can definitely say that I'm, I'm questioning getting the kids back to school. So, George, I think the term you were looking for was a magic wand. Okay. We don't have a magic wand. Jill doesn't have a magic no, wand. No, and, and I'm not criticizing. No, I, I, think, I don't, I don't think it's a criticism. But have we ever thought that we have freshmen in this school this, mm -hmm. this year, so every year? What if this goes on for four years? You know, what type of an education will we be giving them four years? of this. We're doing the best we can, and I would say probably, if you compare us to most other districts, we're probably doing better than most. But four years, if this continues, of this type of an education, 
especially in the trades. Uh, I just think it's it, we need to come up with something better. And and and, and uh, I don't know how I should phrase this, but I, I guess in a lot of cases, what we would do would be to defer to the experts. If we needed a a legal thing, we would defer to the attorney. There's no really experts in this pandemic. Uh, they think they're out there. We don't have all the answers. We're trying to do the best we can with what we have, I guess. Uh, it's so unprecedented. I'm not, finding, I'm not finding fault. I'm finding frustration, like I'm sure my colleagues are, but I, uh, I, I wish I had a, a better mind to deal with it, but I don't have those answers. I, that's why collectively, hopefully, we can do it. I think we're doing the best we can. Uh, I hear decent things out there from the families in the neighborhoods. Uh, I'm not out in the suburbs, but I don't know what my colleagues feel, but uh, it's, it's not only from a technical standpoint, it's, it's from a, either a parochial school or well, high school or wh whatever you want to say, but Excuse me. We don't. I, I'm frustrated, and I'd like to get answers. If there was someone I knew that would help us, we'd be on the phone. I'm sure, but it's, it's a tough act. To I, I don't. I don't think they're going to give answers. Yeah. I but think if you look at other answer. countries, education is first and foremost. They're not doing remote learning because if this goes on for a sustained period of time, you're going to have an extreme brain drain or a gap, and then we fall behind in the world. And we want to stay on top of that. So DESE might need to look to other countries to see what their models are and how they're preventing uh, COVID from spreading within the school, the education. Um, they have the more resources than us in this particular building to do that. Now, I'm sure each one of you has watched the world news in that. The media it has a bias. Um, but other cultures and other countries are doing it differently, and they're putting education first and foremost. The kids are in school. They're not learning outside school. They're making whatever accommodations they can make to get the kids back in school. And maybe we have to look at other answers and other <coughs> solutions and then what has been developed. And, and that will happen if this becomes more sustained. Yes. If it goes into the spring of next year, we're going to have to look at a different model, but right now we're stuck with pretty much what we've set up for this year. And we've got to kind of follow it. Jill and the administration have done a great job bringing us the information. And um, maybe in the next time we look at the numbers and if Lee has the same numbers in the future, maybe we have to look at creating a different model to go back to remote learning. It has to be in that particular age group instead of the general population. We as the committee can do that, at least at this time, but... Um, and, th and that's not mentioned in DESE's guidance at all? No. No. But again, maybe we make a few phone calls and say, hey, maybe we ought to be looking at the data a little different. Because data can be manipulated to whatever solution is being presented at that moment. And I think that's what's happening. However, I don't think the data is inaccurate about a community spread. I think after consultation with the Lowell Department of Public Health and having conversations, they are in agreement that there is a community spread in the city. It's definitely on the increase. There's no ifs, mm -hmm. ands, or buts. And I think it's because there's a lot more testing that's readily available to the citizens of the communities and they're basically mobile and they're, they're free and you get the results whether they're accurate or not that can be questioned you get them pretty much within 48 hours. I mean, we're looking to the medical professionals for guidance mm -hmm. for, for guidance on this. Yep. I just got one more thing. The, the sure freshman. Not. George touched upon the freshman. And it, it just, I, I wrote it down on them picking shops. Mm -hmm. uh, obviously they have to pick a shop. Last year's freshmen picked the shops remotely. Yeah, okay, that's... They did. Okay. 
yeah. Hopefully, maybe things will change and we can come back. Well, the earliest and I'm writing it down, I'm looking on my phone. The earliest we're coming back the next three weeks is the 9th of November. And I mean, that's it, unlikely. It, it is. It looks like we plateaued low, but I, if you look at the number 7, well, it's 9, 16, low, it's really across the state. It's across the state. It's increasing communities that are starting. Yeah, I just. It's an increase across the state. Right. I just, I was, when he said freshman, I just want to make sure we. Kind of make sure they don't get lost in the shuffle in the shops, and it's going to be hard to remote. So we're trying to right now we're providing an, an exploratory program for them. There's one day a week that they come in, and Mike, if you want to step forward to speak but, a little bit about the exploratory program. Sure. Yeah, Mike, I'm just talking about when we because we're going to go full we're going to go full remote. Right. Uh, so yeah, I just want to make sure they don't get lost in the shuffle with the shops, and I, I know it's going to be hard. I, I mean. That's why you're getting paid the big dollars. <laughs> <laughs> um, I totally agree with everything you're saying. I think we're all frustrated. I think uh, to speak specifically about exploratory, uh, we had our transition of exploratory this morning, or rather this afternoon. Um, so we're exploratory. We conducted remotely uh, the exploratory teachers for the first ten days that when we did professional development, they spent a considerable amount of time preparing things online so that they could present their shop. Uh, in the most, uh, the best way, given remotely. But I think um, the commitment, as I agree with you, uh, mm -hmm. it's going to be hard as a freshman to select a shop when you've never really been in it. Um, so I wish I had a better answer for you, but all I can say is that we're doing our best to prepare to provide the best example of what that shop and what that career is like remotely. Um, as you know, the superintendent said, I think uh, one of the benefit, well, not certainly not a benefit, but certainly one of the, the things that I think we need to take a very good look at is uh, using the summertime to not only provide hours for students that need them, but also perhaps providing an experience for the students uh, that they missed in, in exploratory. So I think we need to um, really look at the vacation times that we have. You know, if we're able to bring kids in over Christmas vacation or February vacation or April vacation or certainly in the summertime so that we can grab and use as much time as possible. Um, because as we've said since September, uh, remote learning is certainly no substitute for in-person instruction, especially with our mission. It just doesn't necessarily, you know, it doesn't go well together. No, I just want to make sure we don't lose them. That's yeah, all. I, no, mean, it's, I it's agree really with you. Hard. I mean, how do you, I pick a shop, a machine shop, how do we? A kid, it, it, it's harder to see for that child online what machine shop is, and it's harder for the teacher to say, "Hey, this is a good fit for that that student." Mm -hmm. I just—that's all. I'm more worried about now. Go, hey, look, at, I'm resigned to the fact we have to. We're doing it. We have no choice. Mm -hmm. uh, like the teachers, I know they're doing the best they can. I know they're going to give them the, the, the best effort. They're doing it now. It's just a, it's going to be harder. We're going to do it's classes. Are they going to do full classes, or it's going to be like? Here's an assignment when you're done logging back in. As a, you, you know what I mean? It just yeah. challenges like that we face. Right. I know we'll, we'll be fine, and I agree with George. We're, we're better off than most. You know, and, and I, I truly believe we're better off than most. It's just that it, it's it's just frustrating for me, and it's not directed to you yeah. guys. Yeah. And when George said freshman, I'm like, okay, how? I just don't want to lose them picking shops. That's all. And it's going to be yeah. hard for them to pick. And let, let's get let's be honest, because I, I know me when I was 15, 16. Mm -hmm. I'm not coming to Greater Law in the summer. I don't care. Unless you're paying me to go. Yeah. I'm not coming. Well, it depends I, on. Well, we do have, a, <laughs> in years past, we've had a, a transition program. program with but, yeah, no, but you know what I'm getting. I mean, it's going to be hard to get these kids in the summer to come back to school. I mean, I'm not, I, I'm being honest. When I was 16, the last place I wanted to be, I, I went to Greater Law. It was Greater Law in the summer. Mm -hmm. Here's so, the problem the longer they're out of the building, the more lazy they're going to get. I, I, okay, so and the I less agree. they're going to work, so they're more. I, I think that's so part one of, of oh, my. Sorry. So, so one of the things that we've had extensive discussion with teachers and cluster chairs about is, is learning, from, learning from what we didn't necessarily do or weren't prepared to do in the springtime to give kids reasons why they want to come to class online so that they have regular Google Meets, so they're seeing each other, so they're talking with their teachers, so there's reasons why they need to get up, get ready, and be as normal as possible with school <clears throat> being a setting. So again, it's not, uh, I, I, I'm stressing that uh, as we move forward with this plan, that it should not be, let me post a worksheet, finish that worksheet, and I'll catch up with you later. 
Um, it's more live. I'm seeing you. I'm seeing your friends. We're having discussion. We're talking about what's 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 happening. We can use simulations as best we can, given some software that we purchased in different shops. Demonstrations as best we can. So again, certainly not a substitute for live instruction, but. Uh, you need to give kids a reason to want to cut up and see each other and be with their instructor. And you want them to, you know, the instructors need to, along with administration, create an environment so that they're getting something out of it and something meaningful. And granted, they came here because they want to be with their friends and they want to pick a shop and they want to experience the life instruction. And hey, I, it's, it's frustrating, but I think the charge needs to be to make it as meaningful as possible, as interesting as possible, given this unusual circumstance we're in. So, are the secretaries in Paris coming to school or are they remote? So, it's a choice. Uh, Paris, the, the Paris that work it with our significant special education students will be in the building with them, which is almost all the Paris that we have. They, they will be in the building working with the uh, special ed education students. Uh, as far as instructional staff, uh, they have their choice to either come into the building, which many of them have expressed that they'd rather come into the building to teach rather than teaching from home. So they will continue to, to do that. And those who choose uh, that they prefer to work from home will be, will be able to, to work from home. I, I know you and I talked about this earlier when we talked on the phone. Um, Shawshin text only this, and I hate comparing myself to Shawshin. I'd rather them compare to us. But they're allowing some of the teachers to bring their children in that they have to learn remote to bring them into school. I don't know if we looked into that, because Desi, I saw something on the Desi website saying it was all right for them in a, in a remote learning environment to bring their child into, into school because they can use the internet, they can learn remotely, kind of bring the teacher into school. So. I, I mean, I'm just, I know Shashi's doing well, it. We have not offered that opportunity for our teachers. Uh, at, at this time, I feel we're not bringing in our own students. Why are we having our teachers bring in their students? Uh, if they, you know, if they choose to come in, they come in. And if they need to work from home, they work from home. Uh, I just don't feel like they they would be able to do their their, their, fulfill their job responsibilities while having their children in their classroom here at school. Okay. Now, Massachusetts calls it a red area if there's eight out of 100,000 cases. Right? Or 16 the, out of 100,000. Is that the threshold? Is that like a national standard? Is that a, is that a whatever, a state standard? <coughs> I, I would have to by, look into you know, that. I think that was a standard developed by the Department of Public Health. Here in Massachusetts. As eight is the threshold, yes. Eight per 100,000. Mm -hmm. And the numbers that I'm hearing from Lowell, based on what Lee saw, was 10 to 19, is what, three cases per? Hundred thousand on what? That ten to nineteen age category. So I'm looking at I'm looking at Lowell's data in regards to specifically on the city of Lowell website. So they had two hundred and five cases, uh, and forty five of those cases were from students. Uh, I'm sorry, I shouldn't say students. Were from individuals in the age range. Uh, from zero to nineteen. Yeah, if you, so if you go down a little further, Jill, it says age range zero to five. Uh, there was seven last week. If you go six to ten, there was nine. It's right off their website. I, I trust me. I, I run it just like you do. I get it every Wednesday night. I'm like, they low breaks them on Friday. Mm -hmm. So ten to nineteen is what? You don't have to show it to me. I oh, can't. Yeah. I can't get near you. <laughs> <laughs> Oh boy. There you go, 11 to 14. So I guess my question then is where do you draw the line? No, I mean, this, I'm not a medical expert. Um, no, neither am I. I'm following the, the guidance that the medical and health experts are providing, and I'm not going to draw the line uh, when it comes to anybody's health. 
No, you, you're, like I said, I, I'm going to back your call. You're, you're making the call. Desi gave you the guidelines. We're going by that. I don't agree with the Desi guidelines. I agree with your call because you're going by the Desi guidelines. That's me personally. I think we need the kids in school. but I think we have an obligation to go by the data because right. if, if something happens, then it's on our shoulders. So I, I would rather feel somewhat good with myself that the data that they're providing is what's necessary to make the proper decision. See, I just disagree with the data. I think the data yeah. they're providing is misleading. But no. that's that's the data we have to go by. So that's I'm with right. the, Curtis, I'm, I'm yeah. on board. I mean, the data I we go if, by, if I believe there's a misleading. problem, we got to go to the health department. Right. We don't so, go to Jill. Right. So As much as I'd like to have, have the answer, but... We don't necessarily have to go by the data. Right, the, the 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 state is recommending yeah. that we go ahead and go full remote. Right, you know how based it, on what they see as color codes. I, I guess That's I'll how say they're I, I guess the decision then is who, where do you draw the line? What what is the threshold? What is the threshold? What is the threshold of people catching the flu? I mean, I'm not going to go off. Right, what is the threshold of people right. getting? You know, a number of years ago, the swine flu. I mean, what is the core? Everything's a goddamn threshold. It's just being, it, it's, that, that realistically is tainting and manipulating all of us into being scared shit. And at the end of the day, we can't educate students. We have to educate them in a marginal way on a computer while they're on their bed and paying attention when they want to and not. And it's not truly an effective education. But we just have to follow the guidelines because we all have to err on the side of caution. The threshold well, is red. Mr. Baku, the key we, is to stay who's out red? of the red. Who's red? Yeah. <laughs> Charlie Baker is red. Yeah. Who, who, what, what's the, what, what color is red down in Tennessee? I mean, is, is, is everything 8 out of 100,000? That's why I asked that question. Mm -hmm. I'm sure it's not. Everybody's coming up with their own distinction. I think so. That, yeah. Yeah, that would be the end of my report for tonight. Thank you. All right. Thank you, Joe. Thanks, Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Mr. Sir. Barton. Thank you. Mike, you have the floor. Business manager. Jeez, we can't forget the business manager. I think ah, it's, here we are. He here probably, we are. He just fell asleep over there. <laughs> He's all business now. Should be remote learning. <laughs> all right. So on the uh, ag agenda first, I have an update on the disposal of surplus property that uh, was requested at the, I think it was last meeting, maybe two meetings ago. Um, but in since I've been here at Greater Little Tech um, of, I guess, larger value, we've had a couple of different disposal items. One was the 1989 International uh, Rack Body Truck. Uh, actually, and actually this one we had interest from the city of Lowell when I had sent it out to our municipalities um, and they said they could still use the truck even though it was aging and um, they thought that their DPW would um, still get some use out of it so we've transferred title to the city of Lowell and they're registered and it sh should be out on the road um, now. Um, the other one was a 2007 Freightliner bus that was semi-converted into a transportation slash shop vehicle. Um, and I put this out to a bid on a public auction site called Municipid. We had an initial winning bidder that didn't follow through and complete the purchase, so we listed again. Um, and the second time we had a, a local company uh, interested in purchasing the bus, and they came through and uh, paid $930 and actually drove it out of the parking lot. Um, so those two items are, are gone, and th those are the big ones. The other stuff like tables um, and desks and, and smaller things that we declare as surplus, we generally don't see a lot of action or a lot of interest in. Um, uh, no one's really, there's not a huge market for tables from the 1970s. It's, uh, it's, it is what it is. Um, the next item on my agenda is an update on the school physician. So our school physician retired um, at the end of last school year. And although we tried to make an attempt with our insurance company to see if there was a way to keep him on and under our coverage because he was um, retiring from his own practice, we weren't able to make that happen uh, financially. So uh, after searching for a while and putting out a public solicitation that in yielded no interest, I uh, was able to work with Merrimack Valley Internal Medicine uh, in, contract, in contract with Dr. Dr. Caitlin Waters as well as Merrimack Valley Internal Medicine um, at kind of an, an overall perspective. Um, if something were to happen with Dr. Waters or she couldn't make it, we've got backups in there, other doctors that have committed as well. Where are they um, located, Mike? Uh, they're affiliated with Lowell General, located in 
I believe the main office is a Chelmsford office. Mm -hmm. okay. Um, but they're not, not far. Um, I actually found them by going through Lowell General, and that's where the affiliation came about. Um, uh, but Dr. Waters has a, a focus in sports medicine. She actually currently works with UMass Lowell in, that, in a capacity um, similar to working with, um, I believe it was their um, basketball teams, helping with physicals and sports injuries and things like that. So it makes her a great fit for our sports physicals as well as um, student-related health consulting and, and the other um, things that we use our physician for. Uh, moving on next, I wanted to bring to the committee a recommendation to close a money market uh, account that we have set up with Enterprise Bank. Um, we've had it for at least the last 15 years or so that I could find in our accounting system. Um, and it's rarely been used for uh, the last 10 of them anyway. It holds a, a pretty small balance right around $27,000 and it earns, um, actually this is I'm missing a decimal point here. It's 0.05 or 0.049% interest, so we're not really getting a lot out of that. Uh, it's a small amount of money, but we could move it to our money market account through MNDT, which historically has given us like a 1.5 to 1.9% return. Um, just get a little bit better return, and it's um, just one less place to, one less account to have to worry about and manage uh, from my perspective, which is nice, but uh, ultimately I think it makes sense financially for us to make that move. Um, so I'd look for um, someone to make a motion or approve the suggested motion to close this enterprise money market account, and then we could move our funding over to MMDT. Motion. Second. What was the purpose of that account? Well, is it earmarked for... I know I could not find any history. Um, I chatted with um, our treasurer, David Bradley. He's... Knew of, knew of the account, didn't know why or when it came about. I have a feeling back in the day that this was probably a better money market earner than was available available in other places. So, I mean, it did hold a balance about 12 years ago, upwards of about a million dollars. So I think that was the main investment vehicle at that point. And since we've moved to the um, MMDT accounts and found better returns there. So it's going to go in that account for a long period of time? Yeah, we've maintained pretty much our entire balance of, of cash in the MMDT account, only transferring money when we have uh, a warrant in the specific amount of that warrant um, to other accounts where the money is transferred out. I would venture to say, Captain, that there was probably a, an affiliation with the bank at the time with someone from the school. And we still do use Enterprise. They actually handle our, our checking accounts for accounts payable and payroll. Um, so we do carry a balance and have active accounts with them. Um, this just wasn't one that was active, I guess, is the only way I could put it. <laughs> I'll make the motion. A second. Mr. Tatsias? Yes. Mr. Gilly? Yes. Mr. Gitche? Yes. Mr. Sheehan? Yes. Mr. Bahu? Yes. Mr. Ohia? Mr. O'Hare? Yes. George? He's yeah. there. Yes, good answer. Mr. LeMay? Yes. Mr. Morin? Yes. And I have one transfer that was requested from the um, construction cluster uh, chair that we move from a plumbing equipment account, $12,000, into the carpentry supplies. Um, he, said he felt that the equipment that he had earmarked this for in plumbing we were able to purchase last year and that the funds would be better used in the carpentry shop um, as their supplies generally run uh, as one of his higher line items. So I'll need a, a vote on that as well. Motion. Second. Yes. Mr. Tatsias? Yes. Mr. Gitchia? Yes. Mr. Sheehan? Yes. Mr. Bahu? Yes. Mr. Ovia? Yes. Mr. LeMay? Yes. Mr. Morin? Yes. And finally, just a, a quick update that we do now have uh, a full approved budget. So the budget that we was voted by the committee in August um, has now been approved by Drake at Dunstable and Kingsborough. So 75% of our supporting or our home communities have approved this budget, so now we are off of the 112th budget process. That's our official budget, 
at the time uh, being. Even with the recent state numbers that have come out, the budget still holds. It still looks true to what we had in August. Um, so moving forward, we're ramping up and starting an FY22 budget. Good. Very good. Thanks. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thanks, Thank you. Thank you, Mike. Thank you. Uh, old business. New business. Uh, I'd like to update the committee on the facilities naming committee member appointments that were done at the October 7th uh, facilities naming committee meeting. Based on the naming of facilities policy, members should have been appointed to a three-year term and some were not. In order to correct the situation, appointments were made by the superintendent and myself on the following seats. Ms. Deborah Gassi was appointed to a three-year term to fill the current teacher seat through fiscal year 22. Mr. Robert Dick was appointed to a three-year term to fill the current retired teacher seat through fiscal year 22. Mr. Tim Fallon was appointed to a three-year term to fill the current retired administrator seat through fiscal 22. Mr. Michael Knight was appointed to a three-year term to fill the current administrator seat through fiscal 22. Committeeman Sheehan and Committeeman Tatsius were appointed to fill the three-year terms to, to fill two of the current school committee members' seats through fiscal year 22. In addition, Ms. Kimberly Fabrice was appointed to replace Mr. Dion as a parent member for the remainder of the three-year term. Ms. Fabrice will be replacing Mr. Dion, who no longer has a student attending Greater Law. The committee men motions report of subcommittees uh, I'd like to make uh, I need a motion to enter executive session pursuant to section 21a2 to conduct strategy sessions in preparations for negotiations with non-union personnel superintendent and assistant superintendent to enter into executive session pursuant to Mass General Laws Chapter 30A, Section 21A2, to conduct strategy sessions and preparations for negotiations with non-union personnel, the school business administrator. To enter into executive session pursuant to Mass General Laws Chapter 30A, Section 21A3, to discuss strategy with respect to the collective bargaining or litigation of an opening meeting may have a detrimental effect on the bargaining or litigation position of the public body and chair so declares teachers custodians maintenance security paraprofessional secretaries cluster chairman administrators i need a motion then to back call roll are we gonna, are we gonna adjourn, adjourn right from executive session we're gonna come back and check to come back in. Do we have, look, can I ask a question? Do we have to come back in? We don't have to come back in. No, can we just? Say a, it not. Can we just? I make a motion not to adjourn. Okay. Just a, it, so one and everybody else doesn't have to stick around. Like we just do our business and then yeah, like, those guys can go home. Yeah, yeah that's how I look at it. We don't have to I'll come back in. That. Yeah. That's fine, I guess. Mr. Tatsias? Yes. Mr. Gigi? Yes. Mr. Gitchia? Yes. Mr. Sheehan? Yes. Mr. Bahu? Yes. Mr. O'Hare? Yes. Mr. LeMay? Yes. Mr. Moran? Yes.